Yes, so um, first of all, welcome everybody. Thank you for making the journey. And um, I'm Fiona O'Neill. I know a lot of you in the room. Um, I used to be Head of Workforce at the NIHR Clinical Research Network. I actually um, took a step back and went into early retirement. But a bit like Frank Sinatra, I came out of retirement to lead this project, to help to lead this project um, to achieve registration for clinical research practitioners. So I'm really pleased to be here today with so many people that have helped on that journey. Um, I'm just going to say a few things about housekeeping, as you need to do, and then we'll get started. So you can see the, um, the Twitter handle there and the uh, Wi-Fi, so those that do tweeting, please tweet and help us disseminate the good news. Uh, in terms of housekeeping, there's no um, fire alarm expected, and should there be one, then we just need to follow the... Um, the exit signs and will be directed to the assembly point outside. Some of you will already have discovered that the cloakrooms are right downstairs on the lower ground floor. Um, we will be having lunch just in Wolfson 2, which is behind us. Um, and also we've got some marketing materials in Wolfson 3. So um, we also just lastly, please, um, before you go, leave us your feedback form because um, that would be very important for us to just get a view about how today's been for you. So, so as I say, I've been um, working back within NIHR Clinical Research Network on this project um, for a while now and um, I'm really pleased to be able to share some of the, my own perspectives and thoughts on uh, where we are on our quite significantly long journey and today's um, another milestone on that journey. So, so it's very much been um, a pleasure working on this project because it's really shown how we can be as a network because we wouldn't have got very far along the road to, um, to registration for clinical research practitioners had we not been able to pull upon all the different expertise from across our network. And um, I can't stress enough how much of people's time and energy has been spent on getting us this far along the road. Um, the team at the Coordinating Centre have worked tirelessly on the various documentation. Um, we've recently submitted our application for the register uh, to the Professional Standards Authority and Christine Braithwaite is going to come and talk to us a bit about what an accredited register is a bit later on the programme so you'll have an opportunity to, to find out more. But also for me it's been quite a personal journey as well. Um, I know some of you know me quite well. I started my career as a nurse and then I went into academia for a while and interestingly enough my, my PhD topic was about the sociology of the professions. And um, this is my, my Bible that, I, um, that was like one of the central books in my thesis. And um, it was all about, it really taught me about how professions uh, exist within a very fluid system, all interconnected and forever changing. The, the, you know, the professions that we have today aren't the same as we had 100 years ago, won't be the same as we have in another even 10, 20 years. New professions are always emerging professional boundaries change, we exist in a system and so part of the, um, the journey for me certainly um, with the clinical research practitioners has been like understanding where clinical research practitioners fit within that system of professions and also the really important um, aspects of having a professional identity which is something of course that clinical research practitioners didn't have before. So very much this route to regulation, to registration, has been a vehicle, a professionalising strategy for a group of people who are central to our delivery of clinical research, but, but for no fault of anybody, there wasn't a, a, an identity. It's a role and occupation that has, has grown in response to needs. Nobody ever set out really to create this profession. It's happened because we require it in the research delivery workforce, but it wasn't planned. So in a way, we've been up playing catch-up with the reality of, um, uh, of what's happened in our workforce. So my second uh, sort of academic um, bent, I think, and where I've always spent a lot of time in my career, is in change. I've always really been interested in change and how change happens in organisations and networks. And again, this is one of my favourite models of change, Cotter's eight-point model of change. 
And we still have that uh, diagram above Janice's desk. And from time to time we think, where are we on that, uh, on that escalator? And of course it isn't just the escalator, it goes around in circles. But we're actually, I think we're at um, four, five, we're about to implement a pilot to, uh, to help people to try out our system for registration. And um, so, you know, there's going to be a lot of action happening. We're about to go into a new phase of implementation um, as the register gets established. But um, back to the beginning, the, the very first thing that we had to do was, was, you know, what was the urgency around this? Because when we started looking at this um, about 2016, um, we realised how, what a proportion, what a growing proportion of people in our workforce were working as clinical research practitioners. They didn't always know they were clinical research practitioners because at that time we had a myriad of different um, names for people working in patient-facing roles, um, often in clinical environments, but also in health and social care environments as well, um, very much patient-facing, um, and uh, not necessarily with a, a strong identity, and with varying approaches across the network to training, to development, uh, and to support. And that's not to say that these approaches were not we're not sufficient across different areas in the network. It's just that looking at it from a strategic workforce point of view, it seemed to be not right to have this growing group of, of people in our workforce that we couldn't even really describe. So, so that was the urgency. Obviously, questions were also being asked about, you know, who were these people working in clinical environments? How can we assure that they're safe working with patients safely, that they've got the right skills and knowledge? We, we did find out that sometimes people were missing out on things like mandatory and statutory training that um, clinical staff might have automatically got. So that there were various challenges around this workforce. And, um, but very importantly, these CRPs were contributing great skills, knowledge and expertise, and that wasn't always going as recognised. I mean, one of my um, low points of the year was when we used to have the international... Um, Nurses Day conference and my inbox used to be flooded with emails from clinical research practitioners saying well what meeting can I go to and and you know that was a really important question because we were doing a lot at that time to help develop the identity of nursing and the nursing awards etc and it didn't seem right that this is a the significant group in the workforce so I've already said about the lack of consistency in the way that things were developing in different roles across the network, um, no sense of community really or professional identity. We did have, a, in about 2015, we had our very first meeting for clinical research practitioners in Leeds and I still remember it because it just felt like such a disparate group. It was really even hard to, to settle on a name and I think it shows how far we've come that now we don't even discuss what the name is anymore. But back in those days we used to have endless discussions about what clinical research practitioners should be called. So um, lastly, you know, we, we have a workforce strategy uh, in the clinical research network and, and part of the way that we've supported the um, workforce in the clinical research network is cutting through the workforce in terms of, of occupational groups and professions because that's the way that people organise, you know, I'm a nurse and I had a very strong identity as a nurse and it was easy for me to, you know, to learn and connect with other nurses. So communities of practice are, are a really important way that um, health professionals interact and grow together. So um, again, our strategy for workforce made it almost, you know, seem very clear that we had to, to progress this work. So what did we do? So the first thing that we had to do, and this was back in 2016, was um, get away describing our research delivery workforce. Because at that time, not everybody understood what the research delivery do. The NIHR are funders of the workforce. We don't directly employ them. And so it was really hard to get that sort of strategic vision that other people in the NHS workforce landscape could understand about the, the research delivery workforce. So the integrated workforce tool was a way of describing the entire research delivery workforce, not just clinical research practitioners. Because back to that systems of professions, practitioners fit, sit within this network of, of other people in the teams. So the, um, the, that tool was really the foundational block for us to be able to go forward, um, move forward. 
So the, the second point that was really important was that we didn't just do something wild and wacky as the NIHR. It was really important that we fitted within the regulatory framework and the workforce framework in the UK. So quite early on, I had uh, myself and Susan, Susan Hamer um, went for a meeting at the Professional Standards Authority and learnt about um, accredited registers and the whole regulatory framework around right touch regulation, which is basically saying that um, statutory regulation is like one end of the spectrum, but not all professions need statutory regulation. Regulation should be in response to proportion to risk. And because it was felt that our workforce is relatively risk-free because it's very well governed, there's all the R&D governance, there's GCP, so actually our workforce isn't seen as a particularly high-risk workforce, so it was seen that um, an accredited register rather than a statutory regulation would be sufficient for our workforce. And in fact, the whole route to regulation provided us with a, a route map of what we could do to address those challenges around professional identity, consistency and language around it. So um, we were put in touch with the Academy for Healthcare Science and Janet Monkman is going to be talking a bit about the Academy later this morning. And um, they look after accredited registers for the healthcare science workforce. And it seemed a really good fit for us because we are involved in healthcare science. It seemed a very logical fit for us to work with the Academy. And because of the Academy's expertise in developing, um, helping organisations to come on the registers, to set up their own registers, it seemed a really sensible thing for us to do. So um, we did consult and engage with many people and there was an agreement that we would work to um, progress to a, an accredited re register by December 2019. And a lot of the steering group members are here in the room today uh, Nick Lemoyne, who was the chair of the steering group, he is here. And um, so we, we had a lot of support advice along the way. And this has been a very carefully planned initiative. So lots of work has taken place. It doesn't seem like four bullet points is enough to really get across the amount of work that has taken place. Um, but at every step of the way, we've had input from people across the network, help from the academy, um, to develop our scope and standards uh, to meet the, the requirements of the Academy and the PSA. A um, very important step along the way was in uh, 2018 when we launched a directory um, and that was a way of like starting to get hold of our clinical research practitioners um, in, um, so that we can consult and engage with them. And the, the directory, we've got about 500 members on the directory at the moment, which is not a bad target. Um, a lot of people, I think, are waiting so they can go straight onto the register. But the directory's been a very important holding pen for us, really, to, to allow us to engage and also to consult. And as we move towards the implementation of the register, then we've already got uh, a line in to people on the directory so we can communicate directly and make it easier for people to step onto the register. And as we go forward, of course, not everybody that's working in... Um, uh, see a, um, a practitioner role will be eligible to maybe go on the register straight away, it'll be developmental, it'll be part of induction. So again, the directory is something that people can join while they prepare and um, develop their application to go onto the register. So the directory is going to continue to play a really important role as we move forward. It's not that the directory is stopping once we get the register. Um, so consultation and communication has been absolutely key and that's one of the reasons why we want you all here today because this won't work as a central um, initiative. This will only work when it's owned um, at local level, at local organisational level. And we, we understand that not everybody gets why we're doing this. We understand that some people feel happy with the way that CRPs are looked after in their organisation. But we can't really stress enough that this is about having a strategic view of the workforce and how we can move forward and assure our patients and industry and our other stakeholders that we do look after our workforce and that there are career pathways and we are addressing this uh, issue. Um, we will continue to, to have strong governance as we go forward and the Academy itself has very um, rigorous governance arrangements around the operation of these registers 
Um, you know, it's not that these registers are weak compared to statutory registers, they're different, but they still have the same fitness for practice, they still have the same governance, uh, very strict governance arrangements. So I know I haven't got a lot of time, so I'm going to uh, just say that, you know, I think one of the other things that we'd like you to leave today is with a sense of what you need to do in your local organisations, those of you involved in workforce development, to make this a success locally. So that's what really this afternoon is about, to give you some thinking space to think about what you may need in order to implement this um, where you are. So I feel that today we're in a totally different landscape to 2016 when we first started this work. One of, the, one of my own insights really is how this route to um, re registration has acted as a real, very important catalyst for change. And even without the implementation of a register, there's so, been so much improvement in the way that CRPs uh, are developed and supported without even having the register because it's put the whole spotlight on it and there's been a lot of changes in organisations and um, it does, it feels totally different to back in the, those days when we used to talk endlessly about whether a clinical research practitioner was a suitable name. So the landscape has, has changed really significantly. Um, we're really at that implementing phase now and I, I don't uh, underestimate the work that's going to be involved in that, making that work because it has to work well for people. Um, we're going to do some very careful, iterative work, piloting, um, engaging because it has to work. It can't be seen as this bureaucratic nightmare that we're making people do. It's got to be enabling, it's got to contribute to people's professional development and the development of this professional identity. Um, part of today, and I'm delighted we're in such a great room, is to really thank everybody and celebrate our progress so far. Um, and also, I'm really delighted that we're going to have some of our CRPs talking today. And I think one of the issues is, how do we enable CRPs to become leaders of the profession? I'm not a CRP. I feel like I've, I am now, an honorary one. <laughs> but um, I think it's really important that the leadership comes from you and I think we need to, to find ways of supporting the leadership of this group. Um, we know we have to keep communicating this initiative and we've got some excellent materials now to help communicate so thank you to all the committee that's uh, been involved. And I'd just like to say lastly, I know not everybody is a big fan of this initiative when I go around and talk. I think some people, the jury's out in their minds about why we've needed to do this. But really, I think it's time to get behind it and, um, you know, because the, the minute that people start pulling it apart, then it, people start to lose trust in it. So I really urge people to take the time to understand, to step back, to think about this from a national perspective, um, why, why we've done it this way. And, um, you know, we'll have time to ask questions, to answer questions, etc. as we go through the day. So just lastly to say, when I first retired from, um, from the uh, network, I, I walked the Camino de Santiago and this is me arriving at the cathedral 600 miles on. Uh, it was still shrouded in um, scaffolding at the time, very happy. And, um, <laughs> but then I came back and started on this, um, this other journey with the CRP. So I am actually leaving again, the NIHR, <laughs> and I'm going to do another Camino, I'm going to walk in Portugal this time. But I'm not leaving this initiative because um, the Academy have uh, very uh, warmly offered me the opportunity to work with them on the implementation of the register. And, um, you know, having been so close to it for so long, I feel I can't walk away from it. It's a bit like uh, my children now. So <laughs> it's got me hooked. So uh, once I've walked my next Camino, I shall be back involved um, in this, but not from the NIHR. So, um, but working very closely with the NHS, so I just wanted to share that with you as well. <laughs>